Well, hello there, and welcome to my coffee table and my coffee table books. This one is called Flat Stanley by Jeff Brown, pictures by Scott Nash. Flat Stanley, I'm guessing this here is Stanley. And, hmm, looks like a doorknob. Let's take a look inside. There's Flat Stanley again. Read all of Stanley's Outrageous Adventures. Flat Stanley, Stanley and the Magic Lamp, Stanley in Space, Stanley's Christmas Adventure, and Invisible Stanley. Flat Stanley. Stanley is a name for J.C. and Tony from J.B. Jeff Brown. Uh -huh. Contents. One, the big bulletin board. Two, being flat. Three, Stanley and the Kite. Four, the Museum Thieves. Five, Arthur's Good Idea. There he is again. Oh, there's the picture. Let's take a peek. Hmm. There's that doorknob again. He looks... A little nervous. Chapter one, the big bulletin board. Breakfast was ready. I will go and wake the boys, Mrs. Lambchop said to her husband, George Lambchop. That's a funny name. Just then their younger son, Arthur, called from the bedroom he shared with his brother, Stanley. Hey, come and look. Hey. Oh, that's not Stanley. That's Arthur. Okay. I wonder what's going on. Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop are both very much in favor of politeness and careful speech. Hay is for horses, Arthur, not people, Mr. Lambchop said as they entered the bedroom. Try to remember that. Um, excuse me, Arthur said, but look, he pointed to Stanley's bed. Across it lay the enormous bulletin board that Mr. Lambchop had given the boys as a Christmas, oh, had given the boys a Christmas ago so that they could pin up pictures and messages and maps. It had fallen during the night on top of Stanley. But Stanley was not hurt. In fact, he would have still been sleeping if he had not been woken by his brother's shout. What's going on here? He called out from beneath the enormous board. Oh, that's Mr. Lambchop. There's Arthur, there's Mrs. Lambchop, oh, there's the bulletin board, and there's Stanley. Hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop hurried from the bed. Heavens, said Mrs. Lambchop. Gosh, said Arthur, Stanley's flat. As a pancake, said Mr. Lambchop. Darndest thing I've ever seen. Let's all have breakfast, Mrs. Lambchop said. Then Stanley and I will go see Dr. Dan and hear what he has to say. In his office, Dr. Dan examined Stanley all over. How do you feel, he asked. Does it hurt very much? I, it felt, I felt sort of tickly for a while after I got up, Stanley Lambchop said. But I feel fine now. Well, that's mostly how it is with these cases, said Dr. Dan. We'll just have to keep an eye on this young fellow, he said, when he had finished the examination. Sometimes we doctors, despite all our years of training and experience, can only marvel at how little we really know. Certainly not taking it that seriously. Hmm. Mrs. Lambchop said she thought Stanley's clothes would have to be altered by the tailor now. That's somebody who fixes your clothes. So Dr. Dan told his nurse to take Stanley's measurements. Mrs. Lambchop wrote them down. Stanley was four feet tall, about a foot wide, and half an inch thick. Ha <laughs> ha! 
quicker than going under the door. Well, Arthur's not very happy about that. Chapter two, being flat. When Stanley got used to being flat, he enjoyed it. He could go in and out of rooms, even when the door was closed, just by lying down and sliding through the crack at the bottom. Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop said it was silly, but they were quite proud of him. Oh, Arthur must be jealous. Wait a second. Oh, look what it says. Arthur got jealous and tried to slide under a door, but he just banged his head. Being flat could also be helpful, Stanley found. He was taking a walk with Mrs. Lambchop one afternoon when her favorite ring fell from her finger. The ring rolled across the sidewalk and down between the bars of a grating that covered a deep, dark shaft. Mrs. Lambchop began to cry. I have an idea, Stanley said. He took the laces out of his shoes and an extra pair out of his pocket and tied them all together to make one long lace. Then he tied one end of that to the back of his belt and gave the other end to his mother. What's he going to do? <gasps> oh my goodness. He slipped right through the grates. And where's that ring? There it is. Lower me, he said, and I will look for the ring. Thank you, Stanley, Mrs. Lambchop said. She lowered him between the bars and moved him carefully up and down and from side to side so that he could search the whole floor of the shaft. Two policemen came by and stared at Mrs. Lambchop as she stood holding the long lace that ran down through the grating. She pretended not to notice them. What's the matter, lady? The first policeman asked. Is your yo-yo stuck? I am not playing with a yo-yo, Mrs. Lambchop said sharply. My son is at the other end of this lace, if you must know. Get the net, Harry, said the second. I'm guessing policeman. <laughs> said the second policeman. We've caught a cuckoo. Just then, oh, that means he, they think that Mrs. Lambchop is crazy. Just then, down in the shaft, Stanley cried out, Hooray! Mrs. Lambchop pulled him up and saw that he had the ring. Good for you, Stanley, she said. Then she turned angrily to the policeman. A cuckoo indeed, she said. Shame! The policeman apologized. We didn't get it, lady, they said. We've been hasty. We see that now. People should think twice before making rude remarks, said Mrs. Lambchop, and then not make them at all. The policemen realized that it was a good rule and said they would try to remember it. Hmm. One day, Stanley got a letter from his friend Thomas Anthony Jeffrey, whose family had moved recently to California. A school vacation was about to begin, and Stanley was invited it. Oh, sorry, Stanley was invited to spend it with the Jeffreys. Oh boy, Stanley said, I would love to go. Mrs. Lambchop sighed. A oh, round trip train or airplane ticket to California is very expensive, he said. I will have to think of some cheaper way. When Mr. Lambchop came home from the office that evening, he brought with him an enormous brown paper envelope. Oh, uh-oh. Now then, Stanley, he said, try this for size. The envelope fits Stanley very well. So they couldn't afford the ticket. Hmm. I wonder what they're going to do. There. there was even room left over, Mrs. Lambchop discovered, for an egg salad sandwich made with thin bread and a toothbrush case filled with milk. They had to put a great many stamps on the envelope to pay for both air mail and insurance, but it was much less expensive than a train or airplane ticket to California. Oh, they're going to mail him? Oh, my goodness. 
The next day, Mr. and Mrs. Lamb Chop slid Stanley into his envelope, along with the egg salad sandwich and the toothbrush case full of milk, and mailed him from the box on the corner. The envelope had to be folded to fit through the slot, but Stanley was a limber boy, and inside the box he straightened right up again. Limber, I guess that meant that he could stretch and, and bend. Mrs. Lambchop was nervous because Stanley had never been away from home before. <clears throat> oh, it says he had never been away from home alone before. She rapped on the box. Can you hear me, dear? She called. Are you all right? Stanley's voice came quite clearly. I'm fine. Can I eat my sandwich now? Wait an hour and try not to get overheated, dear, Mrs. Lambchop said. Then she and Mr. Lambchop cried out, Goodbye, goodbye, and went home. Stanley had a fine time in California. When the visit was over, the Jeffreys returned him in a beautiful white envelope they had made themselves. It had a red and it had red and blue markings to show that it was airmail, and Thomas Jeffrey had letter, lettered it valuable and fragile and this end up on both sides. Back home, Stanley told his family he had been handled so carefully he never felt a single bump. Mr. Lambchop said it proved that jet planes were wonderful, and so was the Postal Service, and this was a great age in which to live. Stanley thought so, too.